Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number 12 for our study of God's word on this Good Friday. Hebrews chapter number 12. I love that hymn. Uh, when I survey the wondrous cross, it's been a while since we have sung that. Um, Isaac Watts was reading in the book of Galatians, uh, chapter number 6, when uh, he was um, compelled by the scriptures to take out his pen and write those words. Particularly verse number 2 says, Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. Uh, those words weren't just the words of Isaac Watts. They were also the words of the Apostle Paul. In uh, the book of Galatians, uh, you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to mention it. We're going to be in Hebrews 12 tonight. But in the book of Galatians, there was a problem in the churches of Galatia. They had a problem with this group called the Judaizers. Uh, they had come in and they were trying to impose works and religion and works of the flesh. And uh, they were Jews. They said you needed to do uh, Old Testament practices and ceremonies and rituals in order for their salvation to be effectuated. It wasn't just enough. They had grace and faith in Jesus Christ. They also needed other things. And Paul says, no, you don't. You don't. You just need Jesus. You just need faith in him. And uh, Paul gives us the reason why they wanted these uh, believers in the churches of Galatia to do these external things because the people, the Judaizers, wanted to take credit. They wanted to glory in the acts of the flesh that these believers would be doing. And Paul says in verse 13 of that passage, or verse 14, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot of things people boast in. They brag about what they do in, in terms of religion and how they're good people and they have good works. And Paul said, none of those things are worthy for you to boast in. God did it all. We do nothing. There's one thing you can boast in, and it's the message we're going to preach tonight. You can glory, you can boast about the cross, because that's all the work of his. And that's what inspired Isaac Watts to write that hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. That's one thing we can boast in, save in the death of Christ my God. Wonderful passage of scripture, wonderful hymn to sing about. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter number 12 for our study tonight. Hebrews chapter number 12. As I was reflecting on this service and, and historically what is meant in Christianity to think about the cross, I don't want to be guilty as a preacher tonight simply giving you a history lesson. I'm sure you know vivid details about the crucifixion. I'm sure you know vivid details about what led to the crucifixion. I'm sure you know about the account of Gethsemane. I'm sure you know the account of the trial of Jesus. I'm sure you know the account of how he was led up Golgotha's hill. I'm sure you know the account of how the nails were pierced in his hands and nails went through his feet. I'm sure you know those accounts. We even read about some of the words that Jesus spoke on the cross. But how does that story, and it's more than a story, affect you and I today? Well, if you've never trusted in Christ as your Savior, if you don't have, know that you have a home in heaven, that gospel, that story affects you deeply because if you trust in that Savior that died on the cross for you, you can have eternal life. But is the gospel, that story of Jesus, only for unsaved people? Do we graduate from the gospel after we trust in Christ? If you read through the New Testament, you'll realize, no, you don't. No, you don't. The gospel has a, 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 is effectuating work in your life even today, even after you become a believer. And you know, as Paul and the different writers of the New Testament are writing scripture, you'll often see them coming back to the gospel and showing how it has implications for our life even after we've trusted in Christ. And we're coming to one of those passages in Hebrews chapter number 12. Uh, the writer of Hebrews, we don't necessarily know who the writer was. People have some very good guesses, but we don't aren't definitively told who the writer of Hebrews uh, was, but you'll see from this text that he talks about Jesus. He has an, a knowledge about Jesus, and he shows how the, the, the story of Jesus has a deep and profound impact for people that are already believers. And that's what we want to look at tonight. Hebrews chapter number 12, we're going to look at the first four verses of this text. Uh, notice with me Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number one. He says, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, 
and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And look at verse number three. It's from which we get our title tonight. Notice that for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Verse four, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Uh, With the Lord's help tonight, I want to preach a message to you really right from verse number three, entitled this, Consider Jesus. Consider Jesus. Jesus. Uh, The writer of Hebrews in in verse number one, he does something in verse number one of chapter 12, does something that really happens throughout the New Testament. Namely, he uses a figure of speech to describe the Christian life. In fact, when you go through the New Testament, you'll find the New Testament is filled with metaphors and similes and uh, figures of speech to help us relate what the Christian life is like spiritually to an example, an illustration, something in the physical realm. I'll give an example of this. The Christian life is compared oftentimes in the New Testament to a war, and the Christian is compared to a soldier. And Paul describes it that same way when he says to put on the armor of God. But I don't think you woke up this morning and strapped on boots and strapped on a breastplate and and put on a helmet when you came to church. At least I don't see that. You put on a mask, but that's about it, okay? Uh, You didn't really put on that armor, but why does uh, Paul use these illustrations and metaphors? He's trying to help us to understand from the physical realm a spiritual exercise. He often shows a, a physical discipline that needs to be translated into the spiritual realm, And so he describes various spiritual disciplines, Paul and the other writers of the New Testament, using metaphors. The common metaphor of running a race. We have some runners in um, our church family, namely the Monday family, Brother Ted and Brother Dallas. They're runners. And that was really a a favorite metaphor of the Apostle Paul. And maybe the Apostle Paul wrote Hebrews. We're not 100% sure. If I mention that it's the words of Paul on accident tonight, you'll just take that with a grain of salt because I believe uh, excuse me, Paul wrote uh, Hebrews, but we really don't know who the author was, but Paul loved that illustration, running a race. And that metaphor he used in 1 Corinthians 9, you might remember that passage. And I just want to read a verse from that passage. In verse number 26, he says, I therefore so run. And then he goes on to say, not as uncertainly, And then he says, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. In in one verse, Paul uses two metaphors. He uses the illustration of running the race as running or being in the Christian life. And he also uses the illustration of being a boxer. That's what he means by beating the air. And even though he's using two metaphors in one verse, he's expressing the same idea with the running illustration and the boxing illustrations. He's saying this, the Christian life is like a race, and the Christian life is like a boxing match, all right? They both have a goal. They both have an end. They both have a finish line. They both have a purpose. And Paul said, it'd be silly if I got in the boxing ring and I just started beating the air with no opponent. You wouldn't find, maybe you don't even find boxing entertaining. You probably don't unless you're a man in here, right? The ladies, they don't like that kind of stuff. But if you find boxing entertaining, it's because there are two people going against each other. You wouldn't watch boxing if there was just one guy boxing the air. That makes no sense. And Paul says, it doesn't make sense. And I'm going to make maybe some people so upset. (laughs) But it doesn't make sense to go out and run just to run. (laughs) Yeah, I know. (laughs) You have to have a purpose. I understand, Brother Dallas. I know. You say you're beating a time or you're running a race and you're, you know, it's it's for your health. I understand. That's your purpose. I don't think that's a good purpose. No, I'm just kidding. Hey, listen. In high school, if you gave me a ball, you gave me a field, I would run for days. But if you just said, hey, just run. Go on a treadmill and run. I'd say, what's the purpose? What's the point? That evolves. You know, I have to have a motivation for doing that. And so maybe that illustration falls short with the guys in the back. For the rest of us, we can relate. Hey, if you're going to run or you're going to box, you have to have a purpose. You have to have a reason why you do that. You have to have a finish line. You have to have a goal. And so that's the metaphor that Paul uses or the writer of Hebrews uses in Hebrews 12.1. And I want you to look at three elements tonight, the first one being that metaphor, and then we're going to look at the motivation. What is the motivation for running this race, the, the being in the Christian life and, and going forward in the Christian life? We're going to also look at the motto, who perfectly personified what it meant to live a life of faith and living the Christian life perfectly. 
And I think you already know who that is. So let's look at these three elements, the metaphor, the motivation, the model, and the motivation tonight. Notice with me, number one, the metaphor. Hebrews 12, verse number one. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. That, first, uh, that phrase I want to look at, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You'll notice the pronouns that are used in that passage, that phrase, is the, the common pronoun that us. He, the author groups himself in with the audience to whom he is writing. And so that begs a question of us, and that question is, who is the author of Hebrews writing to? Understanding that context will better help us understand this passage of Scripture. Now, as you study the background, of this book, you'll find it, the, really there's a big hint in the title, Hebrews. Who is he writing to ethnicity-wise? Jews, all right? Hebrews, that's right. And I don't know exactly uh, what the background of the author was, but we can at least say this. He had some kind of training in Judaism. Either he was a Jew and he was trained like a Pharisee, like Paul would have been, or else if he wasn't a Jew, he at least knew the Old Testament very well. He probably had memorized the Pentateuch. He probably had memorized uh, at least the book of Leviticus because he has a great knowledge of the Old Testament, the Old Testament sacrificial system, the Old Testament uh, practices and ceremonies as he's writing the book of Hebrews. And he is writing to a Jewish audience. That's why he puts all these Jewish elements inside the book of Hebrews. He's writing to a Jewish audience. But it's something unique about this Jewish audience. They weren't just Jews, but they had become believers in Jesus. They had become believers in the Messiah. But they had an issue. They had a problem. And we're not really told that we can study a little bit of the background. We're not told why they had a problem. Maybe it was because persecution was coming on them for being a Christian. This book was written right around the time of Nero, we believe, or there's some different dates that we have. We're not entirely sure, but maybe there was persecution, and these Jews were realizing, man, if I just go back to Judaism, there probably would be less persecution. Because these Christians are being blamed for the burning of Rome by Nero, and the persecution is really coming down upon us. If I just go back to Judaism, maybe I would have less persecution. Maybe there were just some Jews who had gotten saved, and there was this pull from the old life. By the way, can I tell you, when you get saved and your family doesn't follow suit, and maybe extended family... When you leave religion and begin a relationship with Jesus, there's often a strong pull. It's just natural. Satan wants you back in that old lifestyle, living the way that you did. He doesn't want you to begin a relationship with Jesus and walking with the Lord. And there's always pulls just to come back the way that you were and not be fervent in your Christian life. And so maybe it was persecution that was causing this, or maybe it was just the pull from family or society as a whole to say, listen, leave the, that Christianity stuff. They're just a bunch of weirdos. They have weird beliefs. And they're just all out committed. That's not how you live life. Hey, enjoy some of the vices of sin with us. Hey, hey, come back to this old lifestyle that you enjoy. Come back to Judaism. And the writer of Hebrews writes this book to encourage the Jews to not go back. And he gives this great apologetic book. He's defending Christianity, and he is showing that these people are so tied to the law that they need to see the grace of God in the person of Jesus Christ. He, he wants to show that Jesus is better than all the Old Testament ceremonies and rituals. In fact, he was those ceremonies and rituals pointed to the person of Christ. Hey, you don't need to go back to sacrifices. Christ was the ultimate final sacrifice. And so something's happened, as often happens. When Christ is accepted and the relationship begins, the pull becomes stronger. And so the writer of Hebrews has a central message, and it's to show this, Jesus is better. Jesus is better than Judaism. Jesus is better than uh, those ceremonies and rituals. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of that. And so the audience here is true believers who are Jews who are feeling the pressure to go back to Judaism. And, you know, maybe they came to church and the Christian gathering, maybe they, 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 uh, they were, there were individuals there that were saying, hey, why are you going to that gathering? Why not just be like all the rest of us and just come back and go to synagogue? And they were feeling that pull. You know, I think there's also a secondary audience. It's not explicitly written in the book of Hebrews, but I think there's also a secondary audience to whom the writer of Hebrews is writing to. And this is going to have implication for our text, right? So just hold on with me as we set this context. 
anytime that there are a group of people that have accepted Christ, there are some people that join in with the cause, but they haven't committed their heart. There are some people that are intellectually convinced of Jesus, but they haven't placed their saving faith in his finished work. Uh, They might like what they see in a church. They might even post things on Facebook that look churchy or look Christian-y. They might even uh, congregate with other believers and know how to talk like a Christian, but they are devoid of a relationship with Jesus. And as you look at the book of Hebrews, you kind of wonder as he writes several things, if there weren't some Jews there that looked like a Christian, they sometimes even talked like a Christian, but they weren't truly saved. They didn't have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe there were some Jews that were on the fence. They were Jews that were not accepting Christ by faith, but they were intellectually where the rest of the believers were. By the way, that's a very dangerous place to be. Hey, if you come to church and you think you're a Christian because of where you go or what you do, friend, be careful because the Bible says there's only one way to salvation, and that's through placing your faith and trust in Christ and Christ alone. And so there's this primary audience of Jews who are saved but have a pull to go back to Judaism, and there's a secondary smaller audience of Jews who are intellectually involved in Christianity but are not truly saved. And so with that context, we step into chapter number 12, verse number 1. The metaphor here is likened, the Christian life is likened to a race. And so the writer is saying to those Jewish believers who are saved, who are feeling the pull to go back to Judaism, he's saying to these believers, stop being stationary. I've already showed you that Jesus is better than David. He's the greater David. I've shown you he's better than the sacrificial system. He's the ultimate sacrifice. Christ is better in all respects. So stop being on the fence. Get in on the Christian life. And man, what a powerful message for the church today. Hey, stop being on the fence. Get in in the Christian race. Get in to the Christian life and be all in for Jesus. Hey, that's primarily the message. I think that secondary audience, as they're hearing the words of verse number one, hey, they're not in the race at all. They've never even stepped into the race. You can't run the race, as the writer says, if you're not in the race in the first place. So the metaphor of chapter number 12, verse number one, is if you're a believer, start running your race. You're in the race. Don't be stagnant. Don't be stationary, but run. Be committed to your walk with the Lord. Be committed to Christianity. But if you're an unbeliever, hey, you got to get in the race in the first place. That's the metaphor. Don't be indifferent. Don't be indifferent. Run the race. I was reading J. Vernon McGee this past week, and he said of this passage, the writer is warning Christians of the peril of remaining stationary. And friend, I don't know of a greater peril for American Christianity than the peril of remaining stationary. You might be a believer tonight, but are you in the race? You're in the race, but are you running the race? Are you committed? Are you committed? You remember what Jesus said to the church at Laodicea? Hey, I would rather that you be hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. God desires for you to be all in. All in. That's the metaphor. Don't be indifferent. He's already shown that, he's already shown that though there is temptation to leave Christianity and go back to Judaism, Christ is better. Don't go back. Don't be stationary, but rather go forward. Run the race. And if you're not saved, get in the race. You know the word for race in this passage? It's interesting. It's the word agona. It's from which we get the English word agony. So he's saying, hey, run the agony. Put that on a bumper sticker. And go walk walk to your neighbor who needs needs Christ and say, hey, do you want to join in on my agony? Hey, do you want to join in what is a life of agony and struggle? That's what the writer is saying. Hey, believers, get in the agony. Hey, get in the race. You know, when there's a runner, and uh, Brother Ted can uh, address this better than I could, or Brother Dallas, he, I think he ran an ultra marathon some days ago. And listen, I, I can't even imagine running one mile, let alone, what is that, Brother Dallas, 100 miles or 50? 50 miles. Okay, I can't even drive 50 miles. Okay, but running that, hey, was there a point in that race where it was agonizing? You never ran it, but Yes, of course it was. A race is agonizing. And by the way, he's not talking about a sprint. He's talking about running a race with patience. That word patience has the idea of endurance. So we know he's not talking about a short sprint, a 100-yard dash. He's talking about the ultra. He's talking about a long haul. The Christian life is long, and yes, it's 
agonizing at times. There are times where it's a struggle. But he says, persevere, continue, have steadfastness, agonize. By the way, that's the dichotomy of the Christian life. Yes, we have peace and joy and fulfillment, but not to the exclusion of agony and struggle or even persecution. And he's telling these Jewish believers, listen, when you go all in, you're right, persecution will come. Hey, when you go all in instead of going back to Judaism, yes, you may be persecuted. Yes, you may feel ostracized by your family, but get all in on the agony. Get all in. You know, the writer, let me say this. My wife can tell you that there are, there's something that I, there's not much I disdain more than some of these celebrity preachers, I know I mentioned them multiple times in my sermon because I, it just kind of boils my blood a little bit when I hear celebrity preachers or these social media personalities where they uh, give a very vague Christian message. Uh, they're constantly spreading this feel-good message and with some out-of-context Bible verse and they, and they really beg people to find purpose and know that they are just perfect just the way they are. You know what I'm talking about with that really good tone and, and God wants them to have this easy and abundant and, and amazing life. And, and I, by the way, those things are true but they have to be in the right context. When Jesus said, hey, my burden is light, my yoke is easy, he's not talking about having an easy life. He was talking about what the Pharisees were putting on. He was talking about a works versus faith-based life, right? He's not even talking about the the, the way that you live, right? That's not even the context of that passage. But people give this message that Christianity, man, if you just accept Christ, everything will be just so great. And, and you'll just have, oh, it'll be like a cloud in the sky, just jumping from cloud to cloud and tulips are growing everywhere. And it's just amazing. It's just so amazing. And listen, that could not be farther from the biblical picture of the Christian life. It is an agonizing struggle when you do it right. But the Christian has this amazing assurance that even though I go through the struggle, Jesus goes with me. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying is this, yes, it will be agonizing to be all in for Christ, but when Jesus is doing it with you, you can't trade that for all the peace that this world can offer. It's better with Jesus, even the agony, even the struggle. The Christian life is supposed to be a struggle in one sense when you read the New Testament, but it's a struggle that's joined with Jesus and he provides grace to get through it and to flourish despite the adversities and the hardships. Hey, don't long, don't long for the peace that this world offers to the exclusion of Jesus. That's not real peace. Give me the race of struggle, but give me that race of struggle with him. For I know when he's with me, there is no struggle, no hardship, no valley, no adversity that I cannot go with him where he won't carry me through. The race is not a sprint, it's a marathon because he says you must run it with patience. It means endurance, steadfastness. And really quickly, two qualities he gives to run the Christian life. He says, lay aside every weight. You know what that means? I'll illustrate it for you. There was a, a Russian sprinter named Valery Bortsov, and he won the gold medal in 1972. He came to America to do his American tour, and he was running races, but he kept on losing race after race after race. They interviewed Mr. Bortsov after one of his races where he lost, and, and they asked him, why do you keep on losing after you won the gold medal? And Mr. Bortsov said this, it's because I am three pounds overweight. Listen, I would love to be three pounds overweight, and maybe you're in that same boat with me, okay? Three pounds doesn't seem like a whole lot, but when you have a goal and a mission and you're doing something on purpose and you're trying to excel and win, hey, three pounds is a lot. What did that runner have to do? He had to shed that excess weight in order to be excellent in the craft that he was in. And a man vying for excellence in the Christian life Three pounds is too much. So the writer doesn't say some weight, but every weight. Every weight. What is he referring to these weights? We won't get into the context of the previous passage, but he's talking about effectively running the Christian life, and I really believe the author is referring to is not materialism or other sins of the flesh. I think in the context of a Jewish mom, he's talking about the vestiges of their old religion. He's talking about the works that are trying to keep them down from excelling. Hey, this race is a race of faith. It's a race that, you, that is only enabled by the grace of God. It's not a race that you run by doing good works and relying on those good works to carry you through. And what he's talking about weights, I think he's really referring to these Jews that were holding on to the works of the flesh and the, their circumcision and their rites and their rituals. And he says, listen, take off that legalism and come to a true understanding of what it means to run the Christian life. And by the way, that's still happens today. There are people that think that if they just live a good work-based life, that will make God think highly of them and pat them on the back and say, good job. 
they think attending church or being good or being kind to a neighbor and those things will give God a, just a, a smile on his face and will approve of them when they get to heaven. Those things aren't bad. Christians ought to be doing those things. But you don't do those things to earn God's love or to earn God's favor, even after you become a Christian. There are some Christians that have a bad theology of sanctification where they think that after you get saved by grace, now it's all about works and you do the Christian life through works. No, there are works in the Christian life, but they always come as a result of loving God and a devotion for God. Good works flow out of that, but the Christian life is still ran the same way that you got saved, by grace, through faith. You don't earn anything with God. It's all through grace, by faith. And when you learn that, you're throwing off the weights. You're throwing off the weights. The second quality is, and the sin which does so easily beset us. By the way, this is a singular sin. I just don't have time to get into what this particular, uh, what avenue this author is going in in this phrase, but I'll give an illustration. Have you ever watched those videos of those people who come to a finish line and they look around them, maybe they're on a bike and they're cycling, and they look around them and they think they won and they raise their hands in triumph and all of a sudden they poof, fall off the bike and someone else wins. Have you seen that? Have you ever seen those people that celebrate too early? Maybe you've seen it in different uh, events where they, there's they're, they're in the Olympics that happens where they're just celebrate, they think they won, they're looking around and they get tripped up. The idea of easily beset you has the idea of being easily distracted, impeded, or tripped up. Can I tell you what sin will do to your Christian life? To your Christian race, it will trip you up. It will trip you up. It will distract you. It will impede you. It will make you fall. Don't allow sin to derail you in this race, and sin will do that. Unconfessed sin will impede and distract and prevent you from running the race. Look at that first passage or first part of the verse. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. I have to be honest with you. I heard this passage growing up a lot, and I've heard it preached a lot, and I've heard it spoken about a lot. Even some commentaries go along this line. I always thought this passage was the idea of, man, there's all these people in heaven in Hebrews 11. You know, it talks about all those uh, saints of the Old Testament, and these are the cloud of witnesses who have gone before us, and and it's often preached this way. It's like there's these grandstands in heaven and they're watching us run the race and, you know, chariots of fire is playing. Dun, 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 dun. And we got the baton in our hand and we're running. And these cloud of witnesses, these Old Testament states are like, yeah, you go, Brother Dave. Oh, yeah, you go, Pastor. You keep on going. And that's how it's always been preached. Can I tell you, that's probably the farthest thing from what this passage is saying, okay? I can't think of a more trivial and silly thing for the saints of old to do than to look down on the sin and struggle of this world. You know what the saints of old are doing? They're basking at the feet of Jesus for millennia and millennia and millennia, worshiping him. They don't care about the sin and struggle of this world. They've been there and done that like we say. The idea of witnesses in this passage of scripture doesn't have so much the idea of being an eyewitness. It doesn't have so much the idea of of watching something unfold before them. That's the idea that we think when we think of witnesses and being an eyewitness. This is using the term of a courtroom. When a witness goes before a judge and he's, he's, he's a witness, he's called to be a witness, he is confirming a testimony of something that has happened. And every time this word witnesses is used in in Hebrews, it's not so much as being an eyewitness, someone that's watching something unfold. It's used in the term of being someone that confirms the validity of something, someone that confirms the testimony of something. And so what the writer of Hebrews is saying is this, listen, we are are surrounded by these Old Testament saints. He's referring back to chapter number 11. He's referring to all these fo- uh, folks who ran their race with patience and they lived the Christian life and they overcame the agony and the struggle and they've gone before us. These are the cloud of witnesses who have gone before us. He's not so much as saying, hey, they are watching you. He's saying, no, you are watching them. This cloud of witnesses has surrounded you, and it's not they're watching you. They could care less about the sin and struggle of this world. It's that we have a great model. We have someone to look to. We have Hebrews chapter number 11. That's why he writes it to say, listen, these are your examples. These are your testimony bearers of what it means to run effectively the Christian life. So see them because you're compassed around about them, because you see them, not because they see you, because you see them run your race with patience just like they did just like they did. That's the metaphor. But I want you to see the model very quickly. Hebrews 12, verse 2. He says, as if those 
testimonies and witnesses weren't enough. Here's the perfect model of what it means to run effectively the Christian life, looking unto Jesus. The author and finisher, the word author has the idea of originator. The beginning and the end is the idea. Author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hey, when you run the race, he's saying this, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Christ. He is the prize. He's the finish line. He's the perfect model. Listen, you have all those Old Testament examples, but there were different points where they fell short. Abraham obeyed God, but he also lied about his wife. Listen, David obeyed God, but he also committed adultery and murder. Hey, those examples fall short, but there is one example that never fell short. It's Jesus. So don't even keep your eyes fixated on those examples. They're there and they're good. They're helpful, but keep your eyes fixated on Christ. The Greek term here literally is to look up and away, to look away from what you're doing right now and look to is the idea. Have you ever been, you've, you've driven in a car before. Where do you look when you're driving a car? You look down the road a certain distance. You don't look at your feet. At least I hope you don't look at your feet. If you look at your feet, I don't want to get in the car with you and drive with you, okay? And this is the idea here. The, 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 the writer of Hebrews is encouraging you, hey, look away from you look away from your struggle and your agony and what you're going. Hey, get your eyes off of you and look to Jesus. Hey, when you're running a marathon, you know where those marathon sprinters and runners are looking? They're not looking at their feet. They're not looking at the arms. They're not looking at themselves. They don't have a mirror where they're looking at themselves while they're running. That would be silly. You know where they're looking? They're looking ahead. And that's the encouragement here. Hey, get your eyes off of yourself and look to Jesus. There's this introspective and self-analysis brand of Christianity that's really coming to the forefront. At least I see it from a, a young person's perspective on social media, which is consumed with looking inward and finding who you are and just get wrapped up so much in, in finding ourselves and who we are and, and this and that. It's like running a race looking at your feet. It doesn't work. Hey, you want to change all of this? I know we got impurities. I know that we have to figure some stuff out, but you really want to change it? Stop looking at it and look to him. When you see the mirror of Jesus, he changes you. Looking at yourself being so introspect, there's a time for that, but if that's your purpose, that's your main thing, it's not really going to fix you. You got to get your eyes on Christ. You have to get your eyes on him. Look away is the idea. His act of faith of Jesus is unsurpassed. God became man and bore our sin and died in confidence that he would be raised by the Father. Hey, think about the cross tonight. And he was exalted again. And, and, he, and it was the greatest act of faith ever. Why? Because he had the most to lose. And the writer is saying, if you need a model of what it means to run the Christian life, fix your gaze, keep your gaze on Jesus. He endured the cross. Why? For two reasons. Because of the joy and because of the triumph. Because the joy that was before him to be glorified and the triumph of sitting at the right hand of God, a place of exaltation that was promised to him. And because of the joy and triumph of running his race, he endured. He, it's the same word as the word patience in verse number one of what we are to have. You know, an athlete knows the thrill of winning, doesn't he? Why does an athlete do what he does? Maybe for a medal, maybe for a trophy, maybe for recognition. But I believe if you really ask an athlete, why do you uh, uh, give hours and hours of a day to, to your craft, to your, to your sport? He'll tell you there's nothing like winning. And there's nothing like winning in Christianity. And it's not a medal. It's not even really the crown, although we will get those as a reward. It's a victory. It's a reward of finishing like Jesus finished. When we run a race well, we run for those goals, the joy of finishing, the joy of pleasing our Savior, and the triumph, the exaltation, the glorification that will happen when we run a race the way God intended, the reward of God's to light. And those from the final point very quickly tonight. We see the model, the perfect model of running the race is Jesus. We saw the metaphor. I want you to notice finally with me the motivation. Motivation. All right, Jesus is our model but what motivates me to run like Jesus did? Well, it has to do with Jesus. Look at verse three. He says, for consider him. Consider him that endured such contradiction. This word means hostility. It even has the idea of a lawsuit. Idea of a lawsuit. 
one who wrote the law, Jesus himself, right? He never violated the law in any point. Yet sinners by virtue were lawbreakers by birth. They brought a lawsuit against the very lawgiver is the idea. Contradiction. He endured the lawsuit from the sinner. Even though he was perfect, he was the lawgiver of sinners against himself. And this is the one you are to consider. And he says, why? Lest ye be wearied. This word wearied means to tire from exertion. It doesn't mean that you're just tired because you woke up in the morning. Or right, there's a lot of Christians that say, oh, I'm just tired of the Christian life, and they haven't done anything yet. This word doesn't mean you're just tired because you're tired, or because, you know, you, you just, that's your state of being. This word means you're running the race well, and you're becoming weird because it's exhausting, it's agonizing. And how do you keep from losing to that agony and that weariness? You consider Jesus. Consider Jesus. It's not talking about someone that's sitting on the sidelines, but that's someone that's running the race. They have the all-out discipline of exerting effort and energy by grace through faith in the Christian life. So lest you be weary and faint, this word means to lose heart or be discouraged in your minds. Church, I want to tell you the race will be a struggle. It's an agonizing struggle. It's not what some of these individuals say that it's easy. It's hard. It's difficult. That's the biblical reality. What to do when the hardships get harder what to do when the struggles become more struggling? What to do when uh, the difficulties become more dip- difficult? Consider Jesus. Remember his audience? It was Jewish believers who no longer are remaining stationary if they're obeying this command, but they're running the race. And what is that going to bring inevitably for these believers? Either ostracization from their family members or their society, or worse, it's going to bring persecution from the government. Difficulty, maybe getting unemployment due to their convictions. And he says, look to your model and your motivation to keep running. Consider Jesus. Consider Jesus. What does that mean tonight as we finish? What does it mean to consider Jesus? It's an urgent imperative in the text. It means do it now and don't delay. It's to contemplate. That, that verb, looking to Jesus, has the idea of a peripheral thing. It's something you do with your eyes. It's something, it's something on the outside. But this word, consider, it's deeper than that. It's, it even carries the idea of repetition, to, to do it over and over and over again, to not stop doing it, to think out carefully. It's an exercise not of the eyes, but of the mind and the heart. It's inside. We use a great word, to meditate. Meditate on Jesus. Think through. This word was used in ancient times to talk about mathematics or accounting. When you went to the market and you bought a piece of, uh, a piece of fruit or something, there were these balances and, they, and these individuals would balance. They would count out and they would balance. That's the idea of this word, consider. Hey, hey, count out. Weigh what Christ did. Consider Christ like it's a math equation. Some of you hate math. And I'm one of those people. But what do you do when you have a math equation? You think through it piece by piece, uh, part by part. You're trying to figure that out. And that's the idea of the consider him. Hey, listen, look at every point of Christ. Understand him in scripture. Go over his sufferings point by point. Go over them again and again and again. Consider him. Consider him. What's interesting about the English word consider is that it comes from a Latin word con, meaning with, and cider, which doesn't mean apple cider, okay, Cider, which means the stars, with the stars. Uh, this past Christmas, my wife asked for a Christmas present that I thought was quite silly. She asked for a pair of binoculars. And I thought, this is, she wants binoculars? I mean, that's kind of, okay, I mean, that's kind of odd. And you know what I did the next day? I went out, and I, well, it wasn't maybe the next day, but it was around that same time. I went out and bought a rangefinder. Do you know what a rangefinder is? It's binoculars except without one of the eye holes, all right? And it's used in golf <laughs> to look at the pins because I like to golf. And I thought her gift was silly. I thought mine was a great purchase. You know, it's a <laughs> it had half of the binoculars missing, and I thought my, my purchase was pretty great. But you know what those are? She's used them. She's got, she got them for Christmas from somebody. And you know what we do with those binoculars or what I do with a range finder? I look at something in the distance, and I try to make it, cl- I can see it better. A telescope, same idea, right? With the stars. How do you get with the stars? Well, you don't have a rocket ship. You don't have a space station. You get a telescope and you can literally be, the idea is with the stars by looking at the telescope. Consider, hey, there's a bright and morning star. His name's Jesus. And there's really a telescope and it's through his word. Hey, how do you see Jesus? How do you consider him? You look at his word. You know, you might see Jesus in a pastor. You might see Jesus in a spouse. But guess what? We fall short, don't we? 
We fall short. You might see Jesus here and there in, in our actions and in the, in the way that we walk, but listen, we still got sin. We still got baggage. You can't see Jesus perfectly in us, although we are striving to be more like him. One day we will be like him, but it, it's a struggle right now. You want to see a perfect picture of Christ? It's right here. Consider him. You've got to have a relationship with the book. If you see that every single book and passage, uh, every single book in the Bible points to Jesus Christ, it will change the way you read scripture. Just think about the idea of Genesis. He's the beginning of beginnings. It, he is the Adam. He is Adam and Eve's lamb covering. He's Abel's sacrifice. He's the promised son of Eve. He's the ark of Noah's salvation. He's the king of Salem. He's Abraham's only born son. He's the sacrifice on Mount Moriah. He's the ram caught in the thicket. He's the wrestler who changed Jacob's name from deceiver to prince. He's the son rejected by his own brothers, but beloved by his father. He's the chosen son who was provider during a famine to a foreign people and to his own family. He's the one to whom the sun and the moon and the stars will bow. He's the scepter of Judah. In Exodus, he was the burning bush. He is the great I am. He is the Passover lamb. He is the manna in the wilderness. He is the rock of horror from which flows living water. He is the tabernacle of God dwelling with men. In Leviticus, he's a picture of all five blood sacrifices, he's the burden-bearing bullock. He is the innocent lamb dying for the guilty. He is the royal priesthood. And friend, you can go book by book and passage by passage, and you know what you'll see when you look at the magnifying glass of Scripture? You see Jesus. Consider him. Consider him lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. By the way, you never need to see him if you're not even running the race. You know why people don't even feel like they need to see him? Because they're not in the race. They might be Christians. But that's not what Paul's talking about or the writer of Hebrews. Talking. He's saying, no, be not stationary, but be fervent in your Christian life. And when you do that, you're going to be wearied. You're going to be famed. You're going to be ostracized. It's going to be a struggle. That's when you need to consider Jesus. But if you're not in the race, you're not going to see that as necessary. But if you are in the race, that's going to be your motivation. It's going to be your lifeblood to see him. What a simple truth. But can I tell you, it will have a profound impact in your Christian life. You can come to a Good Friday service the rest of your life every Good Friday. You can come to church every Sunday if you want to. But if you never see Jesus as intended without an intimate look through the lens of God's word, what's the point? The epitome of consideration is Christ on the cross. That's why the writer says, consider Christ on the cross. As the songwriter said, do you see my Jesus on the cross? The people crying, looking on a man would think it tragedy. But what the world could not see was when they nailed him to that tree, it would break the chains of sin's captivity. Are you considering Jesus? We don't have time to look at verse number four, but the point of verse number four is the writer's encouraging them Listen, you have never gone to the point yet of giving your blood for this race. But there was one who did give his blood. You think it's, it's a struggle, it's difficult right now? You haven't strived, you haven't fought to the point of where you had to give it everything. But there was one who did. There was one who, who went farther than you'll ever have to go. You haven't had to die for your faith, Jew, is what he's writing to. You haven't had to be killed for what you believe. But Jesus did. Consider him. He's your model. He's your motivation. Yes, there's struggle. Yes, there's a cost to follow Jesus. He's telling these Jews. But remember, you don't have it so tough. And listen, in, in American Christianity, we don't have it so tough. You're no great patriarch beheaded for Christ. You're no early church father put in a skin of a sheep and thrown to a lion. You don't have it so tough. You're not like Isaiah who was sawn in half by being stuck in a piece of wood and being sawn asunder. You haven't been put in the lion's den like Daniel. You haven't been like those people hiding in mountains and dens and caves. You haven't had your eyes plucked out like Samson. And when you start getting weary and start getting faint in your mind, remember the witnesses, but remember someone that ultimately gave everything beyond even those witnesses, Christ, who endured such contradiction of sinners. Living for Jesus always costs. Any brand of Christianity that tells you otherwise is not real. But in comparison to the cross, Christian, what have I really suffered for Jesus? Horatius Bonar wrote a poem in 1846. He said this, I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's light. 
Look unto me, thy morn shall rise, and all thy day be bright. I looked to Jesus, and I found in him my star, my sun, and in that light of life I will walk. Can I say to you, I'll run till traveling days are gone. I hope you will consider him. Would you bow with me? Father, thank you for your word and I know I've gone long tonight, like usual. But I thank you, Lord, that these truths are so timeless, all of them. Lord, we're in a race, and there may be some tonight that are sitting on the sidelines. They're stationary. They do their due diligence to Christianity, but they're not all in. They haven't really spent time with you. They're not fervent. Or maybe that's me tonight. Maybe there's an area of my life where I need to be more fervent in my walk with you. Would you show me not to be stationary, but to run, to be all in? And when it gets hard and difficult, may I see my model, Jesus. May I see his suffering and his contradiction that he suffered. And may I use him as motivation, consider him time and time again. When I become wearied and faint, may I go back to the words of Scripture and see Jesus afresh and anew. Even on this Good Friday evening, Lord, I pray that if there's someone here that's not in the race at all, they've never trusted you by faith, they don't know they have an eternal home, or that tonight will be the night of their salvation. For those that are watching, Lord, even on live stream, I pray that if there's someone that needs to respond, I pray that you would convict their heart of this moment to reach out and call us or to text us and reach out to us so they can get that eternal decision secured tonight, except you before it is too late. For the believers in here, I pray that you would not just encourage us tonight, but help us to leave here having taken heed to what we've heard. We'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Just take your copy of, of your hymn book and open to hymn number two.